So good morning, everyone. Good morning. And praise God. Um, let's start with a word of prayer. Father God, to you be all the honor, the glory, and all the praise. We give you thanks for this morning. Thank you for your grace, Lord. You brought us here. You woke us up this morning, Lord God. You watched over us and made sure we got here. Lord, help us to be conscious of these types of ways that, that you show your grace and your sovereignty in our lives, Lord. Lord, as we get into this lesson, we pray that you would awaken us, Lord. Let the message be clear by your grace, Lord. May I step aside and, and you, by your Holy Spirit, take over. And please uh, make the hearts of the people receptive. Open thou our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Yes. In Christ's name, amen. Amen, amen and amen. All right, so we're going to do some uh, rapid fire review before we get into our practical applications. This is the, uh, the only, we're going to be working on practical applications. That was part two. I think it's on the second page. Nice. And um, so let's take our time, but hurry up. <laughs> okay, so last week we gave our case for the clarity of scripture, right? So we spoke, we spoke that we spoke about the Bible being clear. The Bible is clear. Good morning. So what are some things we spoke about in regards to section one? To section one, when we spoke about the Bible is clear, what were some of the things we said? Scripture sufficiency, you know, assuming it's clarity. Right, right. It's not. It's not sufficient if it's not clear, because <laughs> we can't understand it. Right. It will. It will not suffice. Right. <clears throat> so it assumes the clarity. Yeah, not right. Amen. Exactly. Right. That's actually like. Um, when, when, when people were talking to me about Christ, that's what they were encouraging me to do. And, you know, I was reading on my own, and that's what happened. You know, I was being convicted by my sin because I started to see how serious Jesus was about sin, you know? So it was definitely clear for me at that time. So anybody who can answer this question gets a free confession. Who can tell me what Deuteronomy 30, 11 to a 14, uh, who can tell me how Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 14, we looked at this passage last week, how it's biblical proof of the perspicuity of scripture. I'll give it away a free book because I, I said that's a hard one. <laughs> Deuteronomy 30, 10 to 14. All right, we spoke about this last week. Yeah. What's the question you asked? What is the biblical proof of the... Who, sorry, who can tell me how Deuteronomy 30, 11 to 14 is biblical proof of the clarity of Scripture? You don't need to go overseas or go find some obscure genius to figure out the commandments of God or the law of God. You know, it's clear for you to understand it. Um, basically, yeah, you don't need to go beyond the sea or Amen. figure it out. My man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... Does the clarity of scripture end at being able to understand gospel truths? So is, is scripture just clear enough for us to know the gospel? Or is there anything else that it's clear for? The law. Huh? The law. The law in terms of what? How is the law referred to the Christian today? How are we to respond to the law? Right, because we love God, right? So... Right, we want to obey, we want to please God. There's a law, we want to follow his laws, right? It's our rule of duty. 
And it's understand. And it's understand. Huh? And that manifests your salvation. Yep. So exactly, it's a fruit of our salvation. So in section B, we spoke about the Bible is not equally clear in all its parts. And what was the passage that we used? Second Peter three sixteen. All right. And what was the key phrase to our passage that we spoke about? That some of Paul's writings were, were too hard, uh, uh, somewhat hard to understand. All right. And what was that key phrase? Sebastian got it last week. Two words. Uh, security. security. Not unless you're working for a bank. <laughs> the, um, no, some things. Some things. You right? have reached your destination. Oh. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> okay, so, right? Some things were hard according to Peter, when he was referring to Paul's writings, right? And when we spoke about that, what did that, what did those hard things necessitate? What did we say, you know, that those hard things necessitated? Study. To study, right? We needed a, 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 a method of interpretation. And we spoke about also some of the untaught and unstable, and those, those type of men that, that we have to deal with today, right? Then we mentioned that the Bible is not equally clear to all. So when we looked at 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 17, what was the contrast between in that passage? Anybody remember? Do we get a book? <laughs> you want a book? I'm sure you got this one already in your vast library. <laughs> 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 You have this? Yeah. I see, I knew it. <laughs> um, what was the contrast in 2 Timothy 3.15 that we spoke about last week? This is all the stuff we talked about last week. I just wanted to review real quick. Wasn't it about something about uh, man of God or Timothy was... Wait, maybe I'm just thinking something. So I need a contrast in the passage. So you got the man of God. And you said 3.15, correct? Sec no, 2 Timothy 3.15 to 17. So scripture is sufficient for a child and for the man of God, right? And contextually speaking, who is the man of God? We went through this last week, right? So... According to that context, what the phrase man of God, who is that referring to? A shepherd, pastor. All right, a, a minister of the, of the gospel, a, a pastor, an elder, etc., right? Yeah, the, the direct one would be Timothy, and then by extension, other pastors and shepherds. Right. So does that ruin it for the lay person? No. We spoke about that in the past too, right? No, it does not. What is the pastor going to use in order to counsel someone or lead his church, right? All right, so let's move on to practical applications. <clears throat> and I think these are actually, they just, I think they build on one another. If you guys want to get your Bibles ready for Acts chapter 8, verses 30 and 31. So number one, beware of long rangerism. All right, that's AKA individualism. Since the Bible is not equally clear to all, we need teachers and preachers. Does the man of God replace the word of God? No. Does the word of God replace the man of God? Does it? <laughs> huh? We need the man of God a lot of times, right? Yes or no? Do we? Yeah. Yeah, we do. It does not, they don't, they don't cancel each other out. Right? Saying that the scripture is clear does not mean that we do not need a man of God or a minister of the gospel to expound on scripture. So scripture's clarity does not deny our need for the man of God. Now that is not to say that the man of God <clears throat> doesn't need scripture. We see that in our passage, right? When we, were, when we were referring to 2 Timothy. The man of God needs scripture to fulfill his ministry. And that is also not to say that the man of God is holding a priestly authority over the people. Right? That does not mean that the man of God holds that type of you know, tyrannical authority over you. 
It's just, it's just the help, right? He's, he's our God. He's our shepherd. We look to our shepherd. Can somebody read Acts 80, 30 to 31? Before we read that, mm -hmm. um, I think that was a really good question. So when you think about sola scriptura, that doesn't mean you, that you don't have preachers. Right. Because if you, have, if you have the word of God, the word of God is supposed to be preached. It's not supposed to just sit there and collect dust. Yeah, it's exactly. To be read and meditated upon and preached because it, then God had one son and He made him a preacher, and He was the Word of God. Yep. So they, they they work in concert with one another. The Word of God was a preacher. Amen. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. And and the reformers fought to make preaching central mm -hmm. to the worship service. Yeah, actually, preaching from the Word. The, the, the reason that we have one of these in the middle of the stage is because the reformers came along and they took the altar of Roman Catholicism and they trashed it to the side. And they said the word of God is central, not the, the sacraments and, and all the stuff that the priests were doing. The word of God is central. And the preacher has nothing to say apart from the word of God. So you see it even in a visual sense. Yep. So my read. 8.30 to 31. X. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. All right. Thank you, Monica, for reading from that excellent translation of the Bible. <laughs> the NASB, of course. <laughs> Now, what do you think would have happened if the Ethiopian eunuch would have told Philip, yeah, I got this, right? He probably would have misinterpreted Isaiah 53 and introduced a false teaching to Ethiopia. The eunuch needed Philip to help him with the proper interpretation of Isaiah 53. Philip didn't lord any authority over the eunuch, but as a man of God, he faithfully guided the eunuch. You see, once I teach Nicole how to ride her bike, she doesn't come back later asking me to reteach her. Once she knows, she knows. Then it's up to her to learn how to jump ramps and pop wheelies. Once the eunuch understood, once the eunuch understood, he understood, right? Philip's faithfulness results in the Ethiopian eunuch getting saved and baptized. And historically, I think it's even accredited um, to the eunuch. He's, he had, you know, he's accredited for bringing the gospel into Ethiopia. All right. Yeah. Acts, Acts 17, 11. Well, Philip actually left a, a sweeping revival in Samaria to reach one person with the gospel right here. And what I love is that he, he explained it. Um, do we know what the Jews today believe about Isaiah 53? Besides the fact that most of them don't read it. The ones who do, what do they, who do they say it's speaking about? Israel. Well, they are resident Puerto Rican Jew, yes. <laughs> Israel, so imagine mm. if this guy, exactly what Nick said, if he walked away teaching a false gospel and, and a, with a wrong understanding. It would have swayed people further away. Absolutely. All right. Acts 17, 11. All right, so Paul and Silas, they went and taught the Bereans. Not only did they receive the word from the men of God with eagerness, but they went and examined the scriptures to see if it was true. So the point here is that the one did not replace the other. All right, <clears throat> the scriptures were what settled everything, right? They went back to check. In Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, you guys could turn there. And this passage tells us of the gifts, 4, 11 to 13, sorry of the gifts Christ gave the church. But Christ doesn't just give his, his church a box of handkerchiefs, right? Christ gives his church gifts that they need, that she needs. Uh, Aziz, you want to read? Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. gave 
some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the service for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. All right. So if Christ deems it necessary to give his church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, uh, who are we to say, no, thank you, Jesus, we got this, All right? Do you think he knows what his church needs better than we do? Can, can, I, can I just read you know, verse 14? Because I think it goes pretty much in line with, with what, what just you know, Paul says, is that, that we should no longer be children to, tossed to and fro, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Amen. Yep. And maybe, maybe it's that we think more in regards to ourselves rather than the church as a whole and his glory as the primary goal. I think a lot of times we, this lone ranger is, and we, it comes subtly to us. Well, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it's just one, one thing also when it comes to, you know, to that, you know, I mean, coming from from, from a, a, a you know legalistic background, there are a lot of emotionalism involved. You know, and sometimes you know the the sad thing about it is that some of these churches have, they they mis they misunderstand. You know, right here it says you know this is what God appointed teachers and so forth, and, go, and it goes down the line. You know, but yet sometimes come from, the, from that background, it says oh you know today was good service. I felt good today and everything. You know, we got all so emotional that we say it's the Holy Spirit it's, and because we're not, there's no doctrine there. There's no form of teaching there. You know, they just go about saying, well, well this is what the Lord is doing. You know, and in reality, it was just emotion. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of time when we first get saved too, we need someone to direct our zeal. Exactly. Because, um, like even me, you know, experientially, like I remember, you know, I just tried to do everything right and do everything that I thought God was supposed to be doing. I remember catching myself one day and saying, man, you know what? Since I got saved, I haven't broken out one of God's laws. <laughs> you know? And, and, and God, like, God like surely reminded me. <laughs> he was sure not to let that one slide, right? He surely reminded me that that was not the case. <laughs> so, Nick, what, how would you describe actually what loans... Lone rangerism is, and, and why is it dangerous? Well, it's dangerous because you're isolating yourself, in a sense. And you're leaving, you know, um, it's, it's, it's another word for individualism, you know, and you're isolating yourself, and you're kind of not humbling yourself to the fact that we don't always have the answers, you know? And, and you can't be taught, you can't be told. Yeah. Right. You know, so you're alone unto yourself. Yeah, and, and and those people, you find a lot of those people are the people that say, yeah, I'm a Christian, but I don't go to church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, those 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 are lone rangers. And, or, or they go but have their own agenda. Right, you know. Whatever that agenda is. Yeah. Right, so they won't participate. They won't, they won't call anybody during the week. They won't do stuff that pertains to the local church or their local church, but, you know, they just, you know, because some, I mean... Right. They I, they feel that they don't need it. But they come sometimes just to come. Or like you said, they have their own agenda. Yeah, and it's very prideful because they're putting themselves above the body of Christ, saying, I'm part of the body, but I'm going to be a hand over here all the way by myself. Or they come because they like the preacher. And so they go to this preacher, to that preacher, to this preacher, to that preacher. I think sometimes people come because they like the ruckus. They want to be able to argue with somebody about something, right. you know? They come to the <laughs> Yeah, you know. All right, number two. Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> the gift you said in uh, uh, Ephesians 11, mm -hmm. um, they're still for, for today or not? All these names, apostles, prophets? No. There's no apostles, there's no prophets who are speak, speaking a new word. You know, I would say they are evangelists and they're definitely pastors and teachers. You could look at prophecy also as a form of teaching if you want, but um, there are no prophets with a new word from God. 
No Jeremiah swimming around. Nah. No Apostle Pauls. I mean, they try, but they, they just don't fit the bill. It's it's interesting because yeah. in the original, it actually says evangelist and teaching shepherd. They're they're like they're together. It's not really a teacher and a pastor. It's really a teaching shepherd. But. So I know John MacArthur says that uh, the apostle and prophet is now the evangelist and the teaching shepherd. All right. Number two. Uh, if you got any other questions, let me know later. Yeah. Number two, scripture is the only well we are to draw from. Right? So the moment you leave a fleece out overnight to determine God's will for your life, that's when you're lost. <laughs> because at that moment, you have denied the sufficiency and clarity of scripture to be the guide in your life. It's that subtle. It's that easy. Right? Saul fretted and couldn't wait for Samuel, so he himself offered up the burnt offering. What does Samuel tell him? Your kingdom will not endure because you disobeyed the command of Yahweh. Yep. When he was told to destroy all that is Amalek's man, woman, child, and animal, he was to listen to the words of Yahweh. But instead, they brought back some animals. Yahweh tells Samuel, <clears throat> I regret making Saul king, for he has rejected my word. Saul thought he knew better than Yahweh, boasting he had kept he had kept his word, right? Samuel said, oh yeah, so how come I hear all the bads in the background? <clears throat> I practice all week. He goes, <laughs> he goes on to say, because you have rejected the word of Yahweh, God has rejected you as king. Reject his word, it doesn't turn out well, right? Is it not better to obey than to sacrifice? Saul's knucklehead self in chapter 28 inquires in, of Yahweh, who in return does not answer back. And rather than that spring in repentance, what does he do? He searches out a medium. Then he's told by Samuel that the kingdom has been torn away from him <clears throat> because he did not obey the word of God. What's the moral of the story? Well, when we disobey the word of the Lord, it doesn't turn out well for us. Taking duties God has ordained for others in his word, disobeying clear commands and finally looking elsewhere can bring great trouble in our lives. Because it's us saying, Lord, your word is not enough. Or Lord, I think I know better than you. After all, we're down here and you're up there. You're not just in tune. You're not in tune with the times like I am or like this palm reader is. For the Christian to look elsewhere for God's will and guidance is to reject the word of Yahweh as sufficient and clear enough to meet our needs. How you should live, what to believe, how to glorify God, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, guidance and direction is all found in his word. Right? Not Barnes and Nobles in the help cell, in the self-help section. Right? Any other well would be a detriment to our spiritual lives. We need not look anywhere else. It's in the book. Now, in case you're saying, well, I'm going to skip that. <laughs> Let's just move on to number three. We spoke about that already, the man of God. Number three, the perfection of Scripture, right? That's, that's sufficiency and clarity as a whole, should not cancel out skepticism. So here's a question. What's wrong with the phrase or argument, great men of God have differed? Or, that's only your interpretation. What's wrong with that? You're going back and forth with somebody and that's what they come up with. Yeah, it leads, it leads people to believe that there's more than one way to, one way to make that or that it's all right to define the intention of the author. All right. This he says that the, well, the, the proper interpretation is from us, like we're the source of the interpretation. Like, like, for example, where Paul interpreted scripture, like, he was the source of wisdom, rather than God was the source of wisdom. All right. Well, it goes back to, to, to proper hermeneutics. You know, what, what, what is it that, that you know, what, what is the scripture telling me, as opposed to what I think it says? Right. Right. And yeah, all those answers are good answers, and ultimately, it's just a cop-out. Right? It's a declaration that you don't believe scripture is clear and sufficient enough. You don't believe that God was clear about it in his word. I mean, there's only one meaning to a text. Right. Like how many places can we go? <laughs> exactly. You need to, to implore 
Well, you know, proper harmony is to try to find that one meaning. Yep. You know what I mean? But there's only one meaning. There's not a multitude of meanings. I mean, that's the way Christ did it, right? That God has left certain areas cloudy and people just have to agree to disagree. Yet at least six times Christ asked the question, have you not read? And then cites or refers to scripture as the final say in the matter. Right? This must mean that Christ felt scripture was clear and sufficient enough to use in response. It's also an assumption that if you had read, you would have understood and would not be making these mistakes. Also, I think a lot of the people were just informed by tradition and not by mm -hmm. their own study, right? Let's look at Matthew 19, 3. I don't think I'm going to finish today. <laughs> Again. 19, verse 3. Hey, brother, you want to read it for me? Yeah. Pharisees also came unto him, tempting his skin, and said unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? Oh, uh, go down to six, sorry. Oh. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God had joined together, let no man put out and say. Last verse, number six. Oh, I'm sorry. You said and six, right? You didn't go to six. Yeah, yeah. Four five. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. I was, I'm sorry about that. I'll read it. I'll read it. All right. And, Ph and Pharisees came up to him in order to test him and asked him and asked if it was permitted for a man to divorce his wife for any cause. And he answered and said, have you not read? That the one who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, on account of this, a man will leave his father and his mother and will be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, man must not separate. So in here, like this, this was probably a debate on divorce between the two rabbinical schools, the Shammai and the Hillel, right? The Shammai were conservative and the Hillel were liberals. And, that was, and this was, was probably what was brought before Christ. It was probably a debate over Deuteronomy 24, 1 to 4. Now, did Jesus say, well, um, great men of God have differed? Or, well, you know, we all have our own interpretations. Or does he say, hey, why don't you guys just get together and, and come, up, come to a middle ground? Does Jesus does any, do any of that? No, rather he appeals to scripture as the final say. <clears throat> and he also quotes Genesis, right? He also quotes Genesis 2.24. Now notice verse 4 where he, where he does quote that. He says, the one who created said. <clears throat> but look at where Jesus is quoting from. It's Genesis 2. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cling to his wife and they shall be as one flesh. There is no one in particular speaking in this passage in Genesis 2.24. This is a narration. It's just Moses writing. Yet Jesus says that the one who created said. God said that verse. Jesus appealed to the highest and final authority using a plain passage to settle a dispute. So it, it would be a cop out to, to, to just settle on, hey, you know, that's just your interpretation. All right. Skepticism makes the sword of the spirit dull and powerless. Right? You can't preach what you're not sure about. There will be no power if you yourself are not convinced. You can't counsel someone using something you're not sure of. You'll most likely appeal to other resources and philosophies. You can't give your child a verse you're not sure of. Now, how would family worship look if you, your wife, and your kid come up with three different meanings to a passage and just agree to disagree? That's total chaos in the home right there, right? There has to be a final say. And to say sola scriptura is to say that scripture is your ultimate and final authority. But the moment you become a doubter, you question the clarity and sufficiency of scripture. And therefore, in the process, you deny the authority of God, the just, authority of the scriptures. Just to add, you know, when we're pretending to this first, you know, when Christ went back to Genesis, you know, uh, quoting it, uh, there are a lot of churches today, you know, that, that do not look at this verse as opposed to accepting 
you know, the, the question about same sex marriages. You know, so so it's right right there. It's yeah. a very good. See, that's passed. So what I found, and maybe I'm guilty of it too, is we have presuppositions. Like we think something, and then we try to make the scripture to say what we think. Right. And mm-hmm. I mean, so whether we were taught something, we were first saved, and we were, we were taught a certain doctrine, maybe it's very erroneous, but because we believe it, let's say women being preachers and teachers, we heard that we were under women who preached, and so now we go to you know First Timothy two and other places, and we and we try to force fit that meaning onto that text. We do it all the time. So we, we bring our presupposed ideas yeah. to the text and settle in the text to determine what, what we should believe. Yep. Very true. And I think that, that goes back to what Jose was saying before. Using proper hermeneutics is crucial. Yep. So when Nick used well, illustration. Well, hermeneutics is. So hermeneutics is the art and science of biblical interpretation. Bam! So <coughs> when Nick spoke about you can only draw out of one well. Imagine if you threw the bucket down the well, and before you put the bucket down, you filled it up with Coca-Cola, and you drew that out. But that, that's not what was down in the well. The water was down in the well. So you only want to draw up out of God's Word what's in here, and not put your own preconceptions. You know, if you will, pour the soda in the bucket and say, this is what it means to me. It's a sweet-tasting, <laughs> bubbly carbonated substance. No, it's it's water. And so when when we bring our own ideas into it, then you ascribe meanings to words that don't mean during that time what we say it means during this time. And you can get all twisted around. And, and that's how cults start. Cults start in this way. So the Jehovah's Witness, they, they will say, well, yeah, but the word hell... Do, doesn't mean a fiery, burning pit of everlasting destruction. It's just a word for the common grave. Now, now we, that's just dealing with one word, just the word hell. Yep. And there's a whole doctrine out of a misinterpretation of just one word. And when we did the Trinity, they fought over one letter in a word, meaning that Christ was the same substance, or similar substance. Again, the Jehovah's Witnesses took similar, and we have taken the same. So cults start not only by a word, but by a letter that's just off base. A little bit of pride on the side. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So when someone says that's your interpretation, or great men of God have differed, what should our response be? Others' interpretation doesn't matter. It's God. All right. What's, what, what did the God of the man say in the word? <laughs> exactly. That, I mean, honestly, the, don't you believe the sufficiency and clarity of Scripture? Don't you believe that Scripture is clear enough and sufficient enough for us to come to, you know, an answer to that question? Obviously, Christ did. You know, why, you know, why don't you? Yeah, so, like, what's more probable? That God can be wrong or that men can misinterpret what God has said? Us. <laughs> misinterpret we're the problem right which is point number four right sin is the source of doctrinal error right when we get doctrine wrong when we misinterpret a passage any errors in faith and life does not fall on the word of god but on us the dangers that the catholics sought to avoid came to fruition when the lay person was able to read the bible in their own common language different sex were formed through differences and mis- uh, misinterpretations of the Bible, but the reformers felt that those consequences of this Christian liberty did not compare to the consequences of being under the tyranny of the Roman Catholic Church, having their consciences and religious liberty captive in the dark under what Bavin called the Roman Catholic doctrine of obscurity. Right? The reformers wrote, taught about the doctrine of clarity, while the Catholic Church wrote about the doctrine of obscurity. They said, Scripture's too dark for you to understand it, basically, right? Therefore, you need us to authorize whether, you know, and and to tell you what Scripture means. (laughs) They taught that the doctrine was too obscure for the lay person to understand and needed the guidance and the authority of the church. Problem was that a lot of priests were illiterate themselves and really didn't know Scripture. (laughs) They just went off of traditions. This religious oppression poses the greater danger. And so the clarity of scripture is at the core of religious liberty. After darkness, light. 
Right? If Adam wouldn't have sinned, then we'd all have the perfect doctrine together as one whole. But that's not the case. Our errors are sourced in sin because our thinking has been altered by sin. Infant baptism or believer baptism. Whoever has that wrong is in sin. Not that we're in danger of hellfire or we're in habitual sin or purposely sinning, but that sin has altered our thinking where we don't always get things right. That's why scripture is to be the supreme judge of all controversies because it's the infallible, inerrant word of God. That's why scripture has to be our end all. Right, because you could say, well, uh, there are great men of God mm -hmm. like R.C. School and others that held to infant baptism. Right. But they're not our final authority, are they? Nope. And we, and we, I mean, there's probably a, you're probably going to agree with 95% of the things that R.C. Spro says, but when it comes to infant baptism, we're not going to see eye to eye, right? You know, whose fault is that? One of us is wrong. <laughs> so him and MacArthur debated on that. Yeah, I, I, I didn't get to see it, but I have it say I heard. They put the gloves on. It was nice. To see, it was nice. I heard him. Walked out as brothers, <laughs> but not in agreement. Right. So we differ in views because of sin. Otherwise, we would all agree, right? There, then there could be one church, a Reformed Baptist one. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> but anyway, number five. <laughs> a little modest, right? <laughs> Very modest. <laughs> Listen, I'm just convinced. <laughs> I'm convinced we're right, that's all. Anyway, number five. We must presuppose the sufficiency and clarity of Scripture when searching for answers that pertain to life, faith and life. We kind of touched on this, right? People don't go to the Scriptures because they don't believe that their answers are there. It's plain and simple, all right? You know, if we're honest, when we need direction, guidance, wisdom, we look elsewhere first to ourselves or to other worldly answers. I mean, many times we need counsel from an elder or more mature Christian. Many times people on the outside of our situation see what we don't see. That's why we need others. That's why we need our brothers and sisters. Or we just don't know what scripture passages can be relative to our situation. And oftentimes, while that person is listening, this happens a lot, this has happened a lot to me, I'm listening to somebody speak, and I think of a passage of scripture that I could offer this person to help him see things clearly, right? To help guide him in, in, in what's going on in his life. All right? I think a lot of times we also have superficial expectations of the Bible. And when we don't get what we want out of it, we become hesitant to return to it. The Bible is not so we can live our best life now. It's about how we can know, live for, and glorify God. So we really got to stop and think about our approach to Scripture. Am I making this about me? You know, how am I supposed to live, right? To glorify God, not so that I can get, you know, ahead at work or, or anywhere else in life for that matter. All right? Does God have the answers for your life? then the only resource for you to find those answers is his inspired word. Are you confident in God's word? Is God's word your default? You know, it's like when I used to play Street Fighter in my super, with my Super NES, right? I would set the buttons on the controller to my liking, but there was always the factory setting that it came programmed with, and it was called the default setting. Have you programmed yourself to default to scripture for your every need? Is scripture where you go to first? I think, right? I, I think in, in line with that, <clears throat> is it the final arbiter on everything that involves faith and practice? So anytime you hear something in the news, in the media, in the culture, does it filter through this book? Or do you go, you know, um, do you compartmentalize your life and say, well, well, this over here, this is a scientific question versus a moral question. And so you, you have the different people that you go to. I mean, I heard a sermon that Vody Bakken preached on mental health from the scriptures. I was like, wow. But you would think, no, only the mental health counselor can, can deal with this. But the Puritans did soul care. 
the psychology is the psyche is the soul. And so can God deal with our thinking and our mindset? No, we have to go over here to this person who doesn't use the scriptures in that. And that's how many people operate. They come, they chop up their life into different compartments. And they go, this person can answer these moral questions, not the Bible. But if the Bible deals with it, that's what we need to use. Amen. It's, 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 it's true to, to add to what Phil was saying, because we, we do have the tendency of you know, putting everything in different compartments and so forth, mm -hmm. and not returning to the source you know, of Scripture. And, and, and why is it that men do what they do? Why is it that we have the problems that we have today? I, I, I was in a conversation with somebody at the office the other day, and the topic was, what, why, why, why did, did this shooting happen? Why, you know, and, and they always attribute it to oh, some form of sickness and all. And, and I said, could it be also that, that that's the, sim the symptoms of the sinful nature right. of man? Because what does the world say? The right. world says that man is inherently good. Exactly. You know, you know? So, right. So, 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 so all, all to say is that they, they couldn't believe it. You know, I said, in reality, it says, you know, this is what the word is telling me. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm not coming you know, to a conclusion on this, but why is it that men do the things that they do? And, that, and that's a good catch because both people are saying there's something wrong with the person who shot the other person. Right. Yeah. But, but you're or, calling or, it a sickness. Or it's the gun's fault. Yeah, it's the gun's fault. <laughs> the gun's fault. The, the, gun, the gun did it. <laughs> it was written on the gun. He read the gun. And... That's right. <laughs> you know, because, you know, when, when Cain slew his brother, they, <laughs> they blamed it, the National uh, Club Association. <laughs> so oh. both are saying that there's something wrong with this person. This person says it's a sickness, and we're saying it's a sin. But, but what is the sickness that they're talking of here? We're saying... It, it, it's sinful. It's sin, yep. Yeah. <laughs> that is the sickness. Yeah, but everybody wants to bypass that small, right. that small detail, <laughs> right? Right. So, is scripture your default? Right. Have you programmed yourself to default to scripture for your every need, or are you setting your own buttons to suit your comfort? See, these the answers to these questions reveal your view on the sufficiency and clarity of scripture. I think studying this, I, I, I questioned myself and saying, or asked myself or examined myself saying, you know, wow, um, how sufficient do I think scripture is for my life or how clear it is? Knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Amen. I always thought that no matter what happens, he has given us through his word everything we need. Yep. That was the scripture that comes to my mind. Amen. He definitely has. So I got a couple minutes to share something real quick with you. Something that I got from Steve Nichols. I'll try to say that. Steve Nichols talks about uh, three eyes, right? In terms of scripture's clarity. Inspiration, illumination, and interpretation. Inspiration, right? The Spirit gives the Word. And illumination, we spoke about, the Spirit reveals the Word to us. By these two, we know that Scripture is clear. And then he goes on to speak about interpretation, which is very important, right? How we approach Scripture. <clears throat> and he gives us seven ways to interpret Scripture or to read your Bible. All right? Number one, read the Bible reverently. What is your posture when you read scripture? What is your attitude when you approach scripture? Do you contemplate that these are the very words of God? That this is God speaking to us? Right? How do you approach scripture? Do your shoes come off? Do you act like Isaiah and say, woe is me for I am ruined? Or like John, he says, well, you know, <clears throat> when I saw him, I fell to, my, to his feet like a dead man. Mm. What a privilege we have to read the Bible. To read the very words of God. Right? Do you read prayerfully? Do you read before? Do you ask the Spirit's guidance? Right? Number three. Do you, we should read the Bible collectively. Right? 
In 1 Timothy 4.13 it says, Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. You know, don't make your Bible reading exclusive to your own personal devotion. I used to be very guilty of this, right? Family worship should consist of reading Scripture together. At home, we will read through books of the Bible, and everybody gets a portion, like five, everybody gets five verses, and then we all read out together, right? We didn't, also, reading with our brothers and sisters in Christ can also be helpful in a variety of ways. Number four, read the Bible humbly. Acknowledging that you were in God's gift to theology, right? We don't always have all the answers. It takes a chunk out of my pride when I'm told the way I've been interpreting a certain passage has been wrong all along. But do we let our pride cause us to continue in error? We should be willing to hear people out and bring it back to Scripture. Not only will it help us keep our doctrine tight, but we might pick up on some holes in someone else's game that we can address as well. Right? Iron sharpens iron. We spoke about this already. Read the Bible carefully. Right? You must have a careful, interp a, a careful interpretation of the Bible. <clears throat> right? We must historic. We must, you know, find out how it involves what's the historical aspect, the grammatical aspect, the cultural, the rhetorical, the theological methodology, the hermeneutics. <clears throat> Number six, we must read the Bible Christologically. The whole of Scripture is about Christ. It either points to Him or reveals Him explicitly. So another question we should be asking is, where is Christ in this passage? Right? Where is Christ in the book of Ruth? You don't have to answer that. Lastly, <laughs> read the Bible obediently. If you just read it for the cool stories, then you're missing the whole point. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. So another question we can ask is when we approach Scripture is, how does this apply to my life? What command do I need to obey? Where do I need to change? And what do I need to repent of? Mm. All right. Um, brother, you want to close us in prayer? Lord, we thank you for this word, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that we are here, Lord, to learn, Lord, to put in practice, to accept it, that your word that you gave us, Lord, and we have to be obedient. Follow and to do for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.